welcome to the Meadowlark. My name is Donna Hassler. I'm the director of Chester Wood. The Meadowlark is Daniel Chester French's second studio, where he worked on a number of works, including the Abraham Lincoln uh, statue for the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, we're here this afternoon to have a conversation with Judith Shea, who is our sculptor in residence for the month of September. Um, the grant that enables Judith to be here this month was sponsored by the High Meadow Foundation. We thank them for their support. I will be asking Judith about five questions, and I'll open up questions from the audience. Here's some background on the artist. Judith Shea was born in Philadelphia and lives and works in New York. She studied fashion design at the Parsons School of Design, graduating in 1969, and received her Bachelor of Fine Arts at the Parsons New School in 1975. Judith has won numerous awards as a sculptor beginning in 1984 and 1986 with the National Endowment for the Arts Individual Artist Fellowship in Sculpture. In 1989, she was the Guggenheim Museum's sculptor in residence for three months at Chesterwood. She was also a fellow in 1993 at the Augusta St. Gaudens Historic Site in Cornish, New Hampshire, as well as a recipient in the 1994 of the Roman Bronze Fellowship Trustees Award at the American Academy in Rome. In 1995, she won the Arts International Lila Wallace Reader's Digest International Artist Award that was in Mexico, where she resided from September through March 1996. Elected to membership in the National Academy in New York in 1996, she was awarded the Charlotte Dunn Witty Prize for Sculpture at the National Academy Museum in 2007. Having exhibited her work countless times since the 1970s, both in one-person exhibitions and group shows, Judith Shea received prominence early in her career for a sculpture cast in bronze of clothing devoid of the figurative figure within. One of her best-known works, Post Balzac, is in a collection of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C. Her other works can be seen in the major collections throughout the United States, from the Addison Gallery, Phillips Andover in Massachusetts, to the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut. The work that Judith is doing at Chesterwood follows a new body of work recently exhibited titled The Legacy Collection, which was provoked, in her own words, by the imagery and media saturations of the catastrophic events of September 11th and her response to it. The sculptor lives near the former site of the World Trade Center um, for many years. Welcome back to Chester with you. The first question um, is considering your early training in art and design. Um, and I'd like to ask what led you to work in three-dimensional form and your choice of medium. First of all, I think I studied fashion design because I always wore uniforms to school my entire <laughs> life. And so in my teen years, when one is obsessed with one's personal appearance, making clothes became the focus of all my creative activity. Um, and I can only say, it, I don't, none of those items were saved, were salvaged. I can only tell you that my mother used to give me money and say, please, go out and buy some clothes. <laughs> I think they were too creative, really, probably. But at any rate, when I was actually studying, I think by the time I graduated, even though I didn't graduate with awards, I knew that I had outgrown that interest. And that, uh, and I worked less than a full year in the design business in New York, and I really could see that, you know, I didn't live for fashion, and that's what would have really been the only way to survive. That, that, that would have been the only thing that made fun. I also had this idea that it was just part of my creative life, and it was the making of things, which also, by the time I got into that field, 69, 70. Um, already it was just being phased out, the actual hands-on making of clothing. The foundation year of that program anyway was like a finance foundation. It was 
color theory and um, life drawing and all those things that I would have studied in many parts. With the exception of the fact that I really loved what they called three-dimensional design for clothing, or draping was the old-fashioned term, where you actually just take a piece of cloth and you learn how to build a figure mm -hmm. on a dress form from a flat piece of cloth. Looking back on it many years later, I realized had I gone into a sculpture program right at that age, at that I was a little bit young getting out of high school because I started early, uh, I was so impressionable. I think if I had studied sculpture, I would never have learned figure modeling because that was already totally out of style in art. And all the art schools had basically thrown those programs out throw all the equipment out, I would have learned welding and, you know, and then I would have probably had to throw off, you know, the sort of abstract sculpture making aesthetic to find my own work. Instead, I sort of came in it, into it in my own way, which was I, not knowing exactly what I was going to do, I knew that I wasn't going to continue in fashion, so I quit my job. Took every penny I had saved and went to Europe and just traveled around. <laughs> <laughs> opened my eyes and then I came back without a cent. I got a job at the UN, very luckily, working with folk art in a shop that had been started by Ella Roosevelt uh, as a, an outlet for the crafts, the authentic crafts of the women nations. And I just did, just, I used my Parsons degree to help my way into any design job, I would say, you know, I went to Parsons. <laughs> and had such a good reputation that even though I was doing um, display, uh, that was my primary job. Because my boss was an art historian and just a fabulous woman, she would, she would take these art, art books and invite the diplomats to lunch and sit down with these books and say, open to a page and say, you see this? Have you seen this in your country? Can you get it for me? And so we, she, by sight on seeing these sort of batch shifts of folk art. My job was when they came in was to open the crate and she would say, that's garbage, save that, you know, that's, that's like souvenir trash. And we, we have a little, you know, pitch into the dumpster at the end of the work day. Like, Okay, that's souvenir trash. And I have to take the other things, and sometimes it was like they got them out of somebody's hands. That I had to clean them, and sometimes we restream the jewelry, or we get these like a ziploc bag of precious beads, and she'd say, "Make jewelry for me." 